Hello, everyone. This is Steve Marinucci, freelance writer on Billboard.com, Variety.com, Access.com, and whatever.com, welcoming you to another Things We Said Today, where we talk about the Beatles, past, present, and sometimes to come. Let me introduce our two co-hosts. First of all, from the state of Connecticut, who says he's a, a Yankees fan. Boo. You are a Yankees. I fan. might as I might as well be a Yankees fan the way the Mets are playing right now, oh, okay. but uh, I'm still I'm still a true blue Mets fan. Okay, all right. The host of Every Little Thing, uh, Mr. Ken Michaels. Hello, Ken. Hi, Steve. Hi, everybody. And from the state of Maine, somebody I know is not a Red Sox fan. Definitely not. Uh, <laughs> our musicologist, author of uh, Got That Something: How the Beatles I Want to Ch- Hold Your Hand Changed Everything. That is unavailable at the moment, unfortunately. And the Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop, um, which is available. The head of the the Beatles desk at the New York Times that you didn't know existed, Mr. Alan Cosen. Hello, Alan. Hello, Steve. Hello, everyone. That's like uh, the former head of the Beatles. The desk form, the New York. Form, you mean there isn't somebody? There's somebody doing it now. Somebody has taken that over. Uh, no, it's just that I left. Uh, okay, that's right. <laughs> it's the mythological. Beatles desk at the at the New York Times. Anyway, we're going to run through uh, our usual spate of Beatles news um, first before we get to our topic of the evening, which will be the Red and the Blue albums. We're going to talk about those tonight. First of all, we have a sad piece of news, um, the passing of Roy Young, whose name uh, is probably not familiar to everyone but who played with the Beatles in Hamburg. Alan, do you want to you wanna talk about that? Well, he was an organist. Um, I can't remember whose group he played in, though, actually. He was in another of the bands, and a lot of those bands and the Beatles you know, jammed together now and then, sat in with each other. And um, probably Roy Young's most famous contribution to preserved Beatles history is he plays organ on Red Hot, uh, the Hamburg recording of Red hmm. Hot. Um, there wow, may be a I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. There may be a couple of others uh, where you hear him, too, but on Red Hot, he's, you know, sort of right out there. So, um, yeah. He hmm. did play with Tony Sheridan mm-hmm. at the uh, Top Ten Club. Right. right. At a time when apparently Ringo was in the band with Tony for a while so this is um this led to roy going from the top 10 to the star club which is where he got to play with the beatles Mm -hmm. right right so and and somebody remarked this uh on somebody remarked uh, that uh his name was often left out of you know any beatles history and that's probably i mean that's relatively true he's really not that well known that's too bad um he never really got the credit I mean, not that he did a ton of stuff, but, you know, his name was never really associated that much with the Beatles. But according – one story I saw said that Young was offered a place in the Beatles, mm-hmm. and, he, and he turned it down hmm. because, he had a contra- because he had that contract with Star Club. And, yeah. then, he went, and then he went on to play with uh, Cliff Bennett and the Rebel Rousers. Right. So, so. And that band recorded a cover version of Got to Got Get to, get to My, life, My Life, Correct. which Paul produced. Right. And um, that version, by the way, made the top 10 as a single in the UK. That's right. Yeah. It, and it was a good version, too. It, it, it quite was. And he also, Mr. Cozen, mm-hmm. recorded the song Baby, You're Good for Me, written by Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice for the Albert Finney film Gumshoe. <laughs> Hmm. <laughs> well, well was, he might as well have joined the Red Sox, for God's sake. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that was to give him credibility. <laughs> hmm. I'm sorry, I have to. I'm cracking up. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> From Red Hot have... to the Red Sox via <laughs> Andrew Lloyd Webber. Uh, okay. Yeah, there's um, there's uh, an article that I believe you might have shared on Facebook, Steve. Mm-hmm. From the Independent, right, where it says that Roy Young played the piano on "Sweet Georgia Brown" and "Swanee River." But I know that "Swanee River" is not with the Beatles, the Tony right. Sheridan recording. But 
it could be that he's on the the Beatles recording with Sweet Georgia Brown. There's, on piano. there's, there's two versions, as I recall. Alan, tell me, or somebody tell me, correct me. There aren't there two versions of Swanee River, one with and one without. If there's no? one with um, the Beatles, one doesn't exist anymore. Okay, because I thought there was one. There were two of them on the Bear Family set. I don't have that handy in front of me. I can't. I can, it's in the other room, but I could have sworn there were two on that set. But maybe I'm wrong. Well, uh, there were two versions where the later one uh, reflected the Beatles' popularity with Tony okay. singing about them. That's so the, the vocals were different. Sweet Georgia Brown. Yeah. Yeah. So um, no, but I'm talking about Swanee River. We're talking about Swanee River. Oh, okay. Um, well, Swanee River. I'm pretty sure the Beatles never played on. Okay. All right. This is what we're trying trying to dig the stuff up out of our out of our heads. <laughs> um, anyway, the next piece of news is a. Uh, I mean, it's been the Harrison family estate. The Harrison estate has been very quiet for a while, and on April 27th, they announced that they were starting a new record label, Harris Songs, with one R, which that's weird, but it's going to be devoted entirely to Harrison's archive of Indian classical and world music, along with his collaborations. Now, which is really, I mean, they put out the box set collaborations several years ago, which apparently is out of print, but uh, one of the CDs in that box set is Chance of India. So, But the first two releases on Harris Songs will be Chance of India, which of course George promoted with um, John F- uh, Fugel sang uh, George and Ravi uh, in that VH1 appearance, which turned out to be George's last TV appearance. And they're also going to uh, put out uh, or reissue Ravi Shankar and Ali Akbar Khan live in concert in 1972. Unfortunately, not on CD, which which is kind of a shame. But that doesn't necessarily mean there won't be um, something down the line. So yeah, right right now it's strictly a digital release. Right, right, um, and it's going through. They're they're putting it. Uh, the label is being formed with. Craft Recordings, which is part of Concord Music, which is also home to the Wilburys and uh, uh, and others. So there we go. There is a there is a another Harrison connection. It's kind of weird to call it a record label if there aren't going to be records of any kind. I mean, you can debate well, it, whether a CD is a record or not. I, I think it is, but um, if there's no physical manifestation. It's not really a record, right? That's that's true, but you know, uh, I mean, we don't know what what their plans are for the label down the road. I mean, it may very well, they may very well have something in the works down the road that will do that. So, Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, We'll cross our fingers and hope. So, anyway, next piece of news: Paul McCartney has another award in his bonnet. Can I say bonnet? Um, he received the Companion of Honor, which I had never heard of. And I'm, I mean, he's been knighted. Why? You know, what is this? He, it, by the way, he said, "I see this as a huge honor for me and my family, and I think of how proud my Liverpool mum and dad would have been to see this." Well, I didn't know what the Companion of Honor was, and I had to look it up. And it's and I'm going to read straight off the what I found. It's a British honorary institution founded in 1917 by King George V. The only rank is that of companion awarded to men and women who have rendered conspicuous national service, especially in the advancement of culture. And, of course, he got it from music. It said membership of the order is limited to 65, huh. although foreigners can can become honorary companions. So, and it says the prime ministers of Commonwealth countries are allowed to make nominations to the order. Inductions um, don't confer any additional title. I mean, he's already Sir Paul McCartney, and what's better than that? But what I've uh, found here is it says companions are entitled to add CH after their name. So now he's Sir Paul McCartney CH. It says the order's badge is a gold medallion suspended from a carmine ribbon surmounted by a crown. It depicts an armored knight mounted on a horse and an oak tree from which hangs the shield of the royal arms. The blue enameled border of the medallion bears the motto, In Action Faithful and In Honor Clear. Okay. Those Brits are so cute. (laughs) (laughs) 
we have some British people listening to us, Alan. Uh, yes, um, I know. I, I sent all the nasty letters, so I figured I'd oh, give them okay. a new opportunity. And, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and finally, we're just going to mention this very briefly. Um, there was a story in Broadway World about a musical called Dear John Wayoko that sounds very anti-Yoko, but it's actually not. It says it's a musical portrayal of the tempestuous and inspiring love and life shared between Yoko Ono and John Lennon, inspired by Yoko Ono's extraordinary life and her forward-thinking art, combined with the musical inspiration of Broadway hits a la Miss Saigon, Les Mis, there's Andrew Lloyd Webber again, Jesus Christ Superstar, there he is again. Andrew Lloyd Webber was not Les Mis. Oh, wasn't he? I'm sorry. No. Jesus Christ Superstar was, though. So. Yeah. Right? Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Rent and Dreamgirls. So mm-hmm. all those all those great musicals. <laughs> oh, <God>. um, <laughs> and, Andrew Lloyd Webber figures into everything in, in the Beatles story. He's, he's everywhere. Andrew mm-hmm. Lloyd Webber is everywhere. We're not going <laughs> to... He is. Huh? As he should be. Yeah. <laughs> Highest rated TV special a few weeks ago for Easter. She's a yeah. still, superstar. Still yes. haven't watched that. Still haven't watched that whole thing yet. I, it's sitting on my DVR. I still never intend to watch anything. I, I, I didn't think. <laughs> didn't think. I did. I yeah. Well, never mind. I, let's not go into that. We won't well, go off on that. I know you said finally before, but um, we should at least mention that there are unconfirmed reports. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, according to Beetle fan. According well, Beatles, to Beatlefin, and uh, there, there are we should say there are other sources too. Cause being, okay, being the journalist I am, yeah, there are there are Beetle fan reported it, but so have others. Um, that first we, Wings that, albums that we were that we are aware of, mm. um, are saying that the uh, go ahead, Ken. Wildlife and Red Rose Speedway, the first two Wings albums, are slated for the next release as part of the uh, McCartney Archive series of remastered albums, scheduled for release this fall. And according to what I had read on Facebook, there's supposed to be an announcement expected in the next month or so on the release of Paul's new studio album. And it's also likely that we'll be hearing more concert dates coming from Paul. In addition to the announcement last week, which we didn't mention yet, about Paul headlining the Austin City Limits Festival in October. Which makes the the idea that there are more American shows fairly likely. I wouldn't say definitely likely, but I would say fairly likely. So, He's always been generous when it comes to the U.S. Mm-hmm. It'll be interesting to see where the announcements, how the announcements of the new album and the remasters stack. In other words, where they fall, because he's not going to want to have one on top of the other. So, uh, probably not. No. And if the White Album is remastered, as we think it will be, which I would think would probably be in coming out in November on the 50th anniversary, mm-hmm. he probably wouldn't want any of those releases to be too close to that. Right. So. Right. So we will. Yeah. I mean, we will see. We will see. We will see. Anyway. And and. And another thing that you forgot oh. about um, one of George's guitars oh, about to be auctioned. Damn. That's right. Too. Um, <laughs> there's so much. There's so much to talk about. George's first electric guitar is being auctioned by Julian's Auctions, and I wrote about it on Access. And um, I don't remember the details. Um, I have them. Call. You have them. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, sir. Um, well, he uh, first got. It says in a trade with Roy Ennis, who was a member of the Swinging Blue Jeans. And in 1966, with the Beatles' names inscribed on it, believed to have been written by Neil Aspinall, it was donated to a contest and won by a German band. You're reading, and, that, right off my, you're reading that right off my story, you know. Well, you, you, you write so well that thank, I don't want to you. rewrite it. But. Thank you. <laughs> So if you have the article there, why don't you read the rest of it? I, I do have the article. Um, I have it right in front of me, actually. This is, this is going to be fun. Um, the, the, guitar was, the guitar was owned by the group singer and guitarist uh, Frank Dostal until his death in 2017, and his widow is the one that is selling it. And Julian says it's um, worth between $200,000 and $300,000. And... Uh, they used a quote from 
Andy Babiak, the author of Beatles Gear, says George considered the Hofner as one of his favorite guitars, which was the third guitar he ever owned. It is one of the most historically important guitars as it marks the chapter in music history when the Beatles transitioned to a rock and roll band playing electric guitars. And he used it from the uh, starting in the Quarryman days, so it, it, it definitely is historic. And it's part of their music icons auction, which includes a whole bunch of stuff, including a 1963 Beatles set list, which I did not look up, but um, that um, that would be interesting too to to see that. But anywho, okay. By the way, this is this is going to be at the Hard Rock Cafe. Yes, it is. New York City on May the 19th. For yes. anyone that's interested, and you could get you could go, Ken. <laughs> and there's just one might. more thing. Wow. Yes. George Martin's Air Studios are up for sale. Aha. Uh-huh. I've been there. It's a beautiful place. It's in a, it's in a, like an old church that they've converted it into recording studios. It's got three studios. Um he's had several studios over the years including the one in Montserrat. We know it was devastated by a hurricane. Um uh-huh. but this one is uh, Air Lynhurst. It's in Hampstead, part of London. And I went to interview him there in 95, just before the anthology, and got to look around a little. And it really is a gorgeous studio. The largest of the rooms, which I guess is their Studio One, um, is, you know, orchestra size, and a lot of film soundtracks are recorded there. And, uh, you know, I don't know, I don't know uh, what will become of it, um, given that recording studios like record companies and record records themselves are sort of under a lot of financial pressure these days but um mm-hmm. you know there's supposed to be like four million dollars worth of just equipment in the studio so um mm. so if uh, we all want to chip in i think it would be cool to, uh, <laughs> to have you know ultimately we could take, a, take up a cut a collection uh, uh, our, our, with our with our uh, listeners. We could we could do that. Maybe we could just you know own the whole thing. Yeah. Well, you um, know, we could use a new studio to do this show. Definitely. There. You know, it's it's so confining. You know, <laughs> to work the way that that we're doing. Our listeners should help us out. I think. <laughs> I can just see them all going. <laughs> going yes. This, this uh, is like soupy sales here. Really. Uh, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I saw Alan, that show. <laughs> yeah, so did I, so did I many times. Um, I mean, I you, saw the I saw the one where the, he said to go into your father's wallet and take the green stuff. And I didn't right. I did not did not see that one. I saw many <laughs> others though. I saw many others. <laughs> but we're I'm not trying, saying that, okay? No. Um, <laughs> do you happen to know what albums were re- might have been recorded there? Um, um, not offhand, but I know that. Um, U2 and Coldplay, but McCartney's recorded there. I think he's recorded in that one. I'm looking. I, I'm looking. I, uh, I, I think um, you know that you know that clip of um, "While My Guitar Gently Weeps" with uh, George Martin doing the new orchestration mm-hmm. for the Love Show. I'm pretty sure that is in the large room of Air Lynhurst. Kate Bush, I think, may have recorded there. It's hard to tell. Um, you know, from the the listing I've seen, because I, th- I think they're talking about air in general and not just Air Lynnhurst. So, um, a lot yeah, of I'm people looking. have recorded for air at air, but I'm not sure which air they've recorded at. Yeah, I'm looking at a picture. It's a gorgeous studio. Yeah. Oh man, that is beautiful. Mm-hmm. That is really nice. Anyway, maybe Paul okay. should buy it. Yeah. He could probably. He could probably. <laughs> he could probably do it. You could probably, uh, yeah. Their their website shows their clients, and it doesn't make any distinction as to where they've recorded. I mean, there's who's here? Katy Perry, um, David Gilmour. Yeah, I mean, there, there's just a lot. There's a lot of names, you know, mentioned uh, here, but no no distinction as to which studio. Adele, uh, Pete Townsend. Uh, yeah, but again, Van Morrison. But it doesn't mention which studios uh, they use. But uh, Anyway, okay. So the main topic of the evening is the Red and the Blue albums. And uh, I'm going to kick it off, and I'm going to say, listening to this, I mean, I 
when uh, Ken brought this up, actually, and I was going, well, okay. But it was actually actually a, originally uh, a reader suggestion, wasn't it? Was it a reader suggestion? That's right. Okay. That's right. But, you know, when I when we started, when we thought about it, you know, I, I kind of went, oh, okay, you know. But listening to it, I can't understand why it gets passed over so much. Because it's actually a great compilation. And it's actually much better than the one. Because, not only because it's, I mean, it's more well-rounded than the one compilation is. It's a, it's a little weird because of the... The mixes on it, some of the mixes, like all my loving, as I recall, it was a, it was the first place that I believe all my loving and I want to hold your hand were in stereo. Uh, uh, all my loving was stereo way back to with the Beatles. You may be thinking of something else. Though. On C, on on on. It, well, okay, yeah, oh, on CD. Yeah, actually, right on CD. Anything from the first four CDs. Right, it's on here were stereo for the first time on CD. Which was all my love and... I thought and, you meant in, you know, the history of no. the universe. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, there were quite a few. There are, Can't Buy Me Love is in stereo, but there's also a few in mono. Love Me Do um, is in mono. She Loves You, obviously, is in mono. But in any event. Um, but I was really... I was really... It really it was it was fun listening to it again. It had been a long time since I'd picked it up and I and I was really pleased at how how good this was. It's too bad it's kind of been shoved under the rug because it deserves better. What do you, well, uh, go ahead, Ken. Well, the reason it's been shoved under the rug is because the Beatles one took its place. Right. And I know that yeah, you know, what you said it's more well rounded, that's because these collections included album tracks. It wasn't strictly the singles. Mm -hmm. But the Beatles 1 does as great a job as you can possibly do at packing all the singles, U.S. and U.K. combined, that hit number one on one CD. And that was a great accomplishment, putting it all on one CD. But if you want something that's a good starting point for newbies, for new Beatle fans, that's where these collections work. And I think that, you know, kind of like the Beatles one whenever there'd be a resurgence in the Beatles and their albums were on the charts on billboard in the top 200, you'd always see these two collections and they might be at the bottom of the top 200, but they're always there. They were there for a long time, much the same way that anytime Beatles albums resurface now on the charts, the Beatles one is always there. It's always mm -hmm. included. So you know, these are really, I think, the Red and the Blue are both really fine collections. And it's true that um, we shouldn't ignore these. You know, if I was to introduce people to the Beatles now for the first time, uh, I would much rather introduce them to these two collections than That'd to the be, Beatles that, one. See, I, I, I don't agree with that. I think for brand new, for newbies, for real newbies, I think I would start with Beatles one and then move them to the Red and the Blues. But there's so many songs that are that are on one that are no, that no, I repeat, know, you know. But the but the the Beatles one is is distills their you know their success down to those what is it twenty seven tracks or whatever it, whatever it is. But Alan, what do you? Well, see, I I would give them the two thousand nine box set with all of the albums in it because that's. <laughs> 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 um, you know, I don't really think these albums are overlooked. Um, a you know? lot of people, when asked what's, you know, people who, unlike us, don't spend all their time following the Beatles, a lot of people, when asked, will say, you know, what's your favorite Beatles album? They'll say the, you know, the red and the blue, you know, and it, as if they're really albums. And I can kind of understand that if you are not so fascinated with the Beatles that you have to have every track. This set, I mean, you know, obviously it's going to be more well-rounded than one because the red album has 26 tracks on it and the blue album has 28 tracks on it and that's an awful lot more tracks than is on one and as, as ken said it has some album tracks so it it gives you uh you know a really good summary i mean all the big hits are there and a number of things that weren't released on singles are there some things were i think released on singles subsequently to this, actually. Um, and there's a lot of B-sides, too. 
Yeah, there are a lot of bees. I mean, the blue one starts with Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane. And um, so, yeah, you know, and it's a combination of, you know, the British singles and American singles. I think Eight Days a Week is here and uh, certain mm-hmm. things that were singles here that weren't singles in Britain. Um, well, so because it... I, I, I went because I went through and I, I noted the tracks that did not make Beatles one. And there were some pretty significant omissions. Well, yeah, but look um, at how many tracks. I mean, right. Beatles oh, one has like, yeah. what, 20? Right. 27. 27? 27. Oh, mm-hmm. I, I know. I, I, no, I, 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 I get your point. I'm saying they left off Please Please Me. Yeah, they that left, was stupid. Well, they left off All My Lovin'. Um, the purpose of this was to put all number ones on there. No, I know. So, I, I understand that. There understand. were lots of hits the Beatles had that didn't make number one, but they just wanted to put the, the chart toppers on there. Well, I, I, what I'm saying is that the the Red Album and the Blue Album have some important tracks that, I mean, I understand their, their concept, but there are some real bad omissions uh, on Beatles 1. And everybody, you know, everybody, I mean, the Beatles one has been, you know, basically the standard, you know, for Beatles compilations. And it's really, not, it really shouldn't be. No, if, I, I, I don't agree with that at all. If, if the purpose is to have just number ones, the only, the only thing you can debate is please, please me. Mm-hmm. Because the reason why Please Please Me wasn't on there is because they had four different charts going on in England at the same time. And it went by, I think, it had to be unanimous that, it, that a song had to be number one on all four of those charts to make it, to, to be considered a number one. And Please Please Me didn't make it on one of those charts. And so, yeah, I certainly think Please Please Me deserved it. In fact, you, you always heard the Beatles mention their first number one, Please Please Me on the Beatles Christmas message. But it wasn't number one on all those charts. Neither was so Let Me that's, Do. But Let Me Do was number one here. Okay. Well, then that, then that, that doesn't hold up with the argument that Strawberry Fields Forever isn't on Beatles 1. Because well, Penny Lane was the number one hit here. And the flip side, Strawberry Fields, went to number eight. Whereas in the UK, the single itself didn't make number one. There was a big deal about that. That was the first single that didn't make number one in quite some time for the Beatles. So Penny Lane, at the time here in America, both sides of the single charted separately up until the time of Come Together and Something, when I, things I, changed. I No, I, I get that. I'm just saying... Oh, by the by, the omission omissions of those of that song, and please please me. I mean, it, it's it it just points up the weakness of Beatles one. That's okay. that's my point. You know. So, and and the other interesting thing is, or one another interesting thing is the fact that when they put it out on CD, they use the vinyl ordering for the CDs, which was kind of dumb to make two cds for the the red album when they didn't need it you know um mm. so I, I at remember- the same time at the same time since you were talking about the beatles one mm-hmm. there were songs like the ballad of john and yoko which didn't make number one here but made number one in the uk and that made it so you have the benefit of having the ballad of john and yoko on there despite the fact that it didn't make number one here mm-hmm Mm-hmm. Well, that that means they were inconsistent then. So, <laughs> well, I, I tend to look at things more positively. You well, know, if you're going I mean, strictly yeah. by num- by number ones, whichever made number one on either the either here or in the UK, it's on there. That's what that CD is supposed to represent. And by wow. the same token, by the same token, Day Tripper which was a di- uh, double-sided hit here in America, we can work it out when to number one. Day Tripper didn't. But Day Tripper was a, a, a double-sided hit in the UK, which went to number one, and that's why Day Tripper's on there. Mm-hmm. So you do have the benefit of songs that were hits there, bigger hits there, that weren't number ones here. Please all, please none. <laughs> <laughs> Al- Alan? You, you got something to Yeah, there's kick something in? else about, about the red and the blue, which is that um, they were the first of the post-breakup compilations um, to come out. And then 
capital in particular, and I guess EMI sort of just picked up on what capital was putting together, but they then put together, you know, rock and roll music and love songs and you know, right. movie music, real music, and put out all these things. And the Beatles kind of objected to that. And when they finally settled their 20 years worth of lawsuits with EMI in 1989, one of the provisions was that EMI could not assemble its own compilations and that anything they had to do had to be approved by the Beatles. The exception that they allowed was the Red and the Blue albums. They allowed, you know, even in 1989, I'm not sure when they finally came out on CD, it looks like 93. So that was like four years later. But even in 89, they were saying that the Red and Blue albums will come out and they were the only just sort of general compilations that they allowed at the time. Um, mm -hmm. So that's saying something, you know. I think they recognized that if you want an overview of their music, you know, not a thematic thing like let's just get the number ones or whatever, that the red and the blue really did serve a purpose. And then they, they also have remastered them, you know, since the first CD right. issue. So um, I think that speaks in their favor too. I mean, as you guys know, I'm not a big compilation fan, but that's just because I have all the stuff. I don't really need a compilation. I can make my own playlist. I can make my own mixtape, whatever sure. it is. But I mean, I have these and I have the remasters and I have the vinyl from several countries. So, you know, it's, uh, they, they really are good sets. I mean, if, you know, right. And, yeah, and I think that they, that, like, like I say, a lot of people say that they're their favorites. A lot of people say that they were introduced to the Beatles through these sets. So, you know, there's that. One thing that could always be debatable is, well, you know, for most people, greatest hits albums and compilations are important. A lot of people buy only those and don't buy the individual albums from certain artists. But if you're going to eventually get deeper into an artist catalog, a lot of fans start off with Greatest Hits albums. And prior to the Red and the Blue, we only had a collection of Beatle oldies in the UK. Mm -hmm. And here in America, we had the Hey Jude uh, compilation. Mm -hmm. But those really weren't complete in any way. They were, and, they were um, really just sort of catch-alls for things that hadn't been on albums in both cases. Right. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, no, the red and the blue is certainly extremely important, and I think it's important for a, a number of reasons. Like I said, you have to have some kind of greatest hits compilation, although I was going to say that's kind of debatable, because sometimes I often wish there wasn't a greatest hits on the Beatles, and it would force everybody to buy everything, because so many songs could have been hits that weren't hits. And you know, to focus mainly on the singles, a lot of people may not feel the singles are their best songs. Some mm -hmm. of them are, some of them are not. The mm -hmm. Beatles catalog is so solid throughout. You know, you want everyone to just learn it all, know every song in the catalog. But, you know, it's these are great starter CDs. And I also think that it had a tremendous impact on radio because a lot of the album cuts that are on here became played more, I think, because they were on these compilations. Not that they weren't played before that, but they a lot of stations focused on these songs. They became more emphasis cuts. They became more classic. They became more justified for playing them because mm -hmm. they were on here. You know? Would you, all right, let me let me ask a question then, Ken. It's speaking, uh, I mean, because you you're the radio guy here. When that album came out, did you how did you how did you look at that album as? you know, as instrumental to programming, you know, what you were doing? Well, first of all, not so much what I was doing, but what I heard on the radio. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't get involved with radio until 1982. That's when I started in radio. Okay. But as far as what I heard on the radio, a lot of the album cuts that are on here got played a lot. And they became classics. And, you know, I'm talking about all the years since. If a classic rock station is going to play an album cut, from the Beatles, they're likely to play something. Well, first of all, classic rock, for the most part, doesn't play anything pre-1967 unless there's a specialty program of some kind. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to uh, play anything at all from the Beatles that's an album cut 
on a classic rock station, you're likely that it's going to be something on the Blue Collection. It's likely that it's going to be Lucy in the Sky or A Day in the Life uh, mm -hmm. from Sgt. Pepper or Sgt. Pepper and With Little Help From My Friends, although all the other songs in that album are, are worth playing. But these songs became the emphasis songs on, on radio, especially classic rock radio. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, let's take the White Album, for example. One of the, the few criticisms I might make about this collection is that for a double album, you've only got three songs on there. I don't know necessarily if these were the ones I'd pick, but they were back in the USSR, While My Guitar Gently Weeps, and Oh Blood Dee, Oh Blood Da. So if you're listening to a classic rock station that's going to play music from 1967 on it, they're going to play anything from the White Album, there's a very good chance it's going to be While My Guitar Gently Weeps. There's a good chance it's back in the USSR. And I'm talking about in regular programming, mm -hmm. not, a we not a weekend Beatles show. It's going to be those songs. Mm -hmm. They tend to be those songs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, another, another thing we were talking about this before we started was how they shoved most of George Harrison's songs onto the, the last CD on 60, 67 to 70. But I well, mean, that is when his best stuff was coming out. Right. Yeah, but I was that gonna said, say um, mm -hmm. we could get into some good fights here, probably by talking about what they should have left off and what they should have left on. And they oh, could I'm easily sure have put on Taxman on 62 to 66 and had one George Harrison song on there, at least. Uh, yeah, that um, that's uh, yeah. an omission that, uh, I mean, the, the fact that there's, uh, you know, uh, nothing by... George Harrison on the first CD is like is a mind blower. Why they, why they did that? Uh, that's just really strange. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, you look at um, the Red album, and you've got, well, if you consider "Drive My Car" to be a Rubber Soul song, which mm -hmm. in America it wasn't, but if you think of it as Rubber Soul, then you've got one, two, three, four, five, six songs from Rubber Soul, mm -hmm. and one song from Revolver. Yeah, I mean, Does that's, that make that's sense? almost half yeah. of Rubber Soul right there, you know? Yeah. I think they could have got, I mean, if it were up to me, <laughs> I'd get rid of uh -oh. Obla de Obla Da, and I'd get rid of Long and Winding Road, probably. Mm -hmm. No, um, you can't get rid of that. Yeah, can. Don't like it's it. It's the number one <laughs> record, and it was their last number one. Yeah. So what? It's their swan song. Yeah, I mean, this wasn't. Well, this so isn't so the, you got it on the one album, but um, right, I would have. We didn't know there would be a one album back then. <laughs> okay, um, and if you've got "Love Me Do" on here, their first single, you should have their last single. Well, okay, I I think actually, if you're going to have "Long and Winding Road" on there, you should have "Long and Winding Road" from what also wasn't out at the time, which is "Let It Be Naked," because Ugh. that's much more bearable. <laughs> that's you. Yeah. Of course it is. It's me talking. I like all. I, I like all the versions. We know you do. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I, but I would put on rain. I would put on the inner light or something um, more of George's. Uh, and I and I really like the inner light, and it doesn't get played a lot. And uh, I I would put that in there somewhere. I, I guess right next to Lady Madonna. And uh, what else? I would also, you know, if redoing it now. I would use a ver one of the versions of Across the Universe from either Let It Be Naked or Anthology 3, you know, also get rid of the sort of slowed down, horrible sounding Spectre version. And because those two other versions, you know, without all the, the overdubs and with the uh, Indian instruments more pronounced, those are just exquisite, you know. And I think that the song would benefit greatly from being heard in a better version than it's usually heard in but you got to put yourself you know in 1973 times right and those versions didn't come out then i mean there's but, there, there's a bunch of i mean you can go through the list and come up with i mean do you want to know a secret would have been a great song to put on there although it, it wasn't as in the forefront as you know some of the other songs on there um there's there's quite a few. I mean, uh, you know, uh, you could go through the list and come up with. I mean, you we know, were we were talking about uh, "Gotta Get You Into My Life" earlier. I mean, that would have been uh -huh. that would have been a good one too. I mean, you can we can we can nitpick on on that uh, a lot. Um, and I mean, there, what playlist 
is there a, a you know what Beatles playlist is there that somebody or a list period you know a Beatles songs that somebody doesn't say no 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 let's put that I mean there's all sorts of things we could have we could have done with this I mean I, pr- I pretty much you know they pretty much hit the mark you know as far as that goes you know um, I mean, sometimes when I see that and I love her is on here I always when I think of and I love her uh, I think of if I fell because they're a part of the same single in America and they were the two great ballads from a hard day's night mm-hmm. but if I fell is not on here so, I mean, this is not a perfect collection, but it's still a very good collection. Right. I saw her standing there. It's another one that, uh, I mean, that's mm-hmm. Mr. Mister Cozen. This is why I would give people the 2009 boxed set. It's all there. <laughs> <laughs> the, an, another thing we should mention is the cover photos, which are really right. actually cool yeah. retro. Well, in the case of the 67 to 70, they went back to the the original site and and uh did a you know stood in the same spots that building by the way is gone now right it's long long gone but uh i mean that that's really cool that they that they did that yeah they, that was originally going to be the cover for the get back album right know, that that photo shoot and i think the um the one on the red album is not the same one as please please me i think it's an outtake from that same bunch of sessions Mm-hmm. Or, or that same session, that same photo session. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, but, it's, it's it's a great idea to have those two like that. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad they used that that picture, the the later picture. You know, uh, it's too bad they never put out the Get Back album. I think that was a big mistake. But yep. my, my thinking, we, uh, Ken, we disagree on that one. But uh, <laughs> that's another show. Really? That's, yes. another, that's definitely another show. I'm writing yeah. that down. <laughs> I want to uh, ask the, the two of you, considering the fact that the White Album was a double album, how many songs do you think would have been fair to put on this collection, since there were only three? Hmm. I, I, I can't see more than three or four. Because, really? Yeah, because you had a lot of other songs competing against it. I mean, there's there's so many songs... I mean, I, I, you know, I gave you a, names of a couple, and Alan right. said, said, I mean, there, you, you know, you could have been very, um, you know, uh, you could have been very arbitrary as far as what you were going to put on this thing, and they did what they did, and I'm, you know, for the most part, I think they they made some good choices, you know, but personal opinion, there are things. Rock and roll music is another one, so, you know, there's there's. Well, there's they made sure all the songs on here were originals. There's no covers. True, uh, that, and that's a that's a good point too. That they didn't use any, you know, they didn't use any covers. But that didn't mean that they couldn't have, you know, they didn't. But I guess probably that was part of the. I didn't. I you know I didn't even realize that that they didn't use any covers. But unless you want to count the the little uh, introduction to "All You Need Is Love," is it? <laughs> but. Uh, and and the uh, uh-huh. Indian intro to help. I mean, Indian there, intro, yeah. the James Bond intro to help. Right, right. Um, yeah, you know, but but Ken has a point. I mean, if you have six songs from Rubber Soul, and the double album had thirty tracks on it, um, three isn't a great representation. So. You know, I I love the song. Don't get me wrong, but I would have taken Girl off. Mm-hmm. Hmm. It's a great song. Mm-hmm. But you've got you've already got enough from Rubber Soul on here, right? And there could have been a few more from Revolver, like you said. You know, if you've got a great love song like In My Life or or Michelle, what's wrong with having Here, There, and Everywhere in there? Right. Um, oh, really? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah. There's no question that that there's there you could have made choices, and and actually that's a good that's a good question to throw out to our listeners that if. You have an alternate track listing for either of the albums or, or both of them together. We'd love to see what you do. So you can send them to the Things We Said Today radio show at gmail.com and we'll have a look at them and who knows, maybe we'll mention you. But you know, yeah, in I terms mean, of Revolver as well, that would go on the 62 to 66 set, which is really a single CD's worth of music. You know, right. so there's plenty as I, as I, of flex room there. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, in fact, that was one of the big. Like I said, I think I said earlier, that was one of the big criticisms of the CD that they mm-hmm. they had plenty of room 
uh, you know, they didn't need to make it two CDs and people were complaining about the fact that they were, you know, I mean, it was basically a money grabber to do that. And, you know, you can take that, you can uh, disagree w- with that or not. But, I mean, the fact is that they could have fit the whole album on one CD. So, yeah. I, I should correct myself here. I said there's one song from Revolver, there's two. So, two, uh, that's true. But there are no songs from Yellow Submarine except for Yellow Submarine, which isn't really from Yellow Submarine. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> right. Right. I, I, I could have gone with Hey Bulldog on this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was I was looking down the list, and I, I thought about that, too. So, See, yeah. on the one hand, I, I love the fact that All Brown Chew is part of this, because mm-hmm. I think right. it's a great B-side. And in a way, it kind of justifies, as far as the White Album is concerned, if I had to pick between All Brown Chew or Piggy's Long, Long, Long and Savoy Truffle, I'd go with All Brown Chew, <laughs> mm-hmm. as far as an outstanding track. I love the other ones, but right. I think All Brown Chew works better. Right, right. Well... I mean, yeah, you know, the, the debates are endless. I mean, but it's, a, I mean, the fact remains that it's, that it's a great compilation and it deserves, a, I think, a little better recognition than it's getting now. Um, so at least they remastered it, which says a lot, you know, which says that the Beatles do have a lot of respect for it. They haven't remastered rock and roll music, love songs. You know, the film compilation, they haven't done that either and probably never will. But Yeah, they, they prohibited ha- that, basically. Right. So, cool. I mean, they could, they, I mean, they've done, they've done worse. They did the, they did the, the U.S. Albums box, which was the, you know, where they took the, the U.S. Albums and they, you know, made them all remasters. And the Japanese did the same thing. I mean, they could conceivably do that. Yeah. Um, but they haven't. Right. So, and actually, not to get too off the off the track, but rock and roll music is is actually a good compilation for what it is. Love songs, not so much, at least in my opinion. But well, I like both. Do you? I think they're well well chosen songs. Do you? So let's not yeah. forget the Tomorrow Never Knows compilation that was. Um... You know, that's sort of right. like half a rock and roll music in a way. It was the same right. intention, the hard rocking Beatles. Mm-hmm. Um, and in most cases, that was a download only album, although they did press up, you know, some 12 inch vinyl. I have a 12 inch vinyl of that record. Yeah. But, um, really? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't yeah. know that came out. Hmm. Yes, it did. Yes, it did. I think uh, it came they out never. It was promo only. I'm not sure you could buy right. it. It did. It did come out as promo only. Um, they did not. I. I never. I don't recall seeing any CDs of that. Do you, Alan? No, I didn't. Yeah. No. Yep. So. I got one more question. Go ahead. Do you think that Sergeant Pepper was well represented on the blue set? Because the one thing I found I find rather strange is that for an album that's considered to be Paul's baby, whether you agree with that or not. The songs that Paul sings lead to on the entire songs, like Getting Better, Fixing a Hole, She's Leaving Home, although John, you know, does the counter melody on that. (laughs) Um, When I'm 64, Lovely Rita, none of them are in there. You've only got Sgt. Pepper, the the opening cut of of the album that has Paul on a lead vocal and and also the the bit he does on A Day in the Life. So it's kind of (laughs) strange in a way. That the songs that are predominantly Paul, mainly Paul, are not in here. Mm, I, I, you know, he's he, he. It's not like he's not represented on this, on this thing. I, and I'm remember, only talking about Sergeant Pepper here. Right. I'm not talking about the whole collection. Well, well, I, that I could that could play a, into another debate that um, well, I don't know, a debate, but discussion that Steve and I were having before we um, started the show and before you turned up, Ken. Mm. Which was, um, Steve was mentioning rumors that Alan Klein might have sequenced the sets, which we never got to the bottom of. If anybody knows anything more about that, it would be well, good I, to hear. I, but, I, I do have the, the rough guide to the Beatles in front of me, and it says that. Right, and, and it, so that could so explain why a lot of Paul's stuff is missing. Right, but mm. but uh, um, and it's also... In, in Wikipedia, which I don't trust, but Rough Guide is a you know is a fairly I think a fairly decent source. Mm-hmm. So 
yeah, uh, that, that, and it's not mentioned. His name is not in the books because in the booklets because I we sat here and I scoured them before we started talking, and it's not there. So, right. but yeah, that you're right. That would explain that. But hmm. um, I, I, you know, remember too that at the time these albums came out, Sergeant Pepper hadn't really attained the mythological status that it's got now. At least I don't think so. Don't I mean, think? it's all it's. No, I I, th- I think it's I think it, I mean that's not to say it wasn't always celebrated, but I think between then and now, I think it's gained a lot more. Don't you? No. Hmm. I don't know. It's I, hard I, for me to imagine in yeah. 1973 what people were thinking about. You know, I always remember hearing throughout most of my teenage years onward that Sgt. Pepper was the greatest rock album of all time and the most important one. It was always number one on every single list. So that's the memory that sticks with me about Sgt. Pepper. Well, I no, I agree with that. I'm not saying it's – I mean, it wasn't it, – not that it wasn't celebrated. It was. Um, and it was, I mean, I remember, I remember one time listening to Dan Ingram on WABC freaking out while he was playing uh, Strawberry Fields Forever. Not, I mean, obviously it's not on the album, but I remember he, he, he was questioning the whole idea of, you know, what are the Beatles doing? This is a different Beatles, which is kind of weird, but, Mm -hmm. but I mean, again, what I'm saying is back in, in 73, while, Sergeant Pepper. I'm um, Sergeant Pepper was only a few years old, right? Where, where, I mean, it's been written about and talked about and written about and talked about much more since then, and to the point where I, you know, I don't even think the Beatles thought of it the way they do now. And obviously, with what we just went through with the, you know, with the release of the deluxe set, I mean, look how many years it took them to do that, you know, so. That's because they weren't into anniversaries. <laughs> well, you know, and, they didn't really want to. Mm. Well, I mean, and how many? I mean, let's not get into that again because we did talk about that and how they resisted it. But it's all part of that. I mean, you know, Pepper is a lot more, a lot more celebrated. It's a lot more well known than it was back in 73. I'm, I, 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 would stand, I would stand on that. I mean, Alan, you can disagree with that, but yeah, I, I would Yeah, I disagree. You know. I, I think in, in 73, I think in, in 68, it was already considered the best thing that they'd ever done. Uh, I was, again, I, I, there was I, a I, lot I, of debate about whether the White Album is as good as Pepper or not as good as Pepper, and then everything after that, it was everything was being held up to Pepper. Think about everything that's been said uh, like when the anniversary came out recently, that when Sgt. Pepper came out, it wasn't just a release; it was an event. No, I agree, I agree with that. You know, that's I don't, that's how people looked at it then. But I no, I don't think so. I I don't think if you had done that set in '73, it would have been the same thing. I really I don't. I I I, I mean, that's not to say that we wouldn't have celebrated it as much. I mean, we were looking. You know, I mean, the the whole bootleg thing was just starting you know at that point but i don't think it would have gotten the the notice the acclaim among the fans in the same way maybe i, I could be wrong i mean you know i mean i'm thinking back kind of you know i mean that that's a long time ago so i'm not saying that my my memory is is you know is really clear on what what happened back then but i mean i it just seems to me that the enjoyment and the admiration for Pepper, although it was great, is greater now. Does that make does that make a little more sense? No, I don't know. <laughs> okay, I, I mean, mean today I, the big debate is whether or not Revolver is a better album. You know, and that's all I ever hear about that Revolver surpasses Sgt. Pepper and more people prefer it now, or many people do, and it tops lists. In, and people now say. The accepted word is that while Sgt. Pepper may not be the best album of all time, it's the most important album of all time. Uh, see, That's I, what's accepted. Well, I, it depends on who you're talking to, but okay. uh, and who you're reading. But I don't, <laughs> I don't particularly agree with that. I think Pepper, Pepper is is the king as far as that goes. And don't forget Abbey Road too. I mean, so it's a never-ending debate, <laughs> right? We could sit here and we could sit here and have a boxing match and yeah. 
you know, and, with and, these and, with these things, I mean, okay, uh, apart from the sort of weird outlier of Rubber Soul having nearly half the album on the red set, generally speaking, I think they were trying to give you a taste of all these albums, but not like give away the whole album, you know, so that they'd have mm -hmm. like just, uh, you know, a few of the best things from the album. And then maybe you'd want to go out and buy the whole album. And I think right. in, in, even in the case of Rubber Soul, you know, if you look at it and it, consider that this album was probably assembled in the U.S., whether it was by Klein or not, um, the thing is that a bunch of those Rubber Soul songs for us were Yesterday and Today songs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, so maybe they thought of it in a, a, a slightly different way. Maybe they were looking at it more that way. Ken, let me That's ask possible. You, let me ask a question: As a, do you think the album was programmed, or do you think the albums were programmed well? In other words, the flow from track to track. The, do you think they, as a, if you were to play them, is that the order you would have played them? You know, I hardly ever think about that, and I have, I have, a, I have. A I stumped him. I They're stumped pretty him. much chronological, no, not, aren't they? It's chronological. Pretty much, I, although, although, as I noted, as we were talking beforehand, the the order on the one album is different on some of the tracks. It, they it doesn't they don't fall in the same. In other words, the one tracks were not plucked from that CD and in that same order, which is really kind of weird. So. I don't get what, that at what all. What was out of order on one? I Feel Fine is before Eight Days a Week on the one album. It's after Eight Days a Week on the red album. Okay. Uh, Yesterday is after Help on the one. It's before Help on the on the red. Trying to We're trying to do this in, in... Day Tripper is before We Can Work It Out on the, on the one. It's after on the red. I mean, th th that's those are the weird those are the weird things. What difference does it make? I mean, the yeah, single if it's a single that if it's no, a okay. double sided single, you know, they both came out at the same time. Okay, so it doesn't matter which one was first on one release and and which one was first on the other. Listen, my question was as as you know, programming it, you know, segueing well, the tracks one into the other. Did I think it, in the did, case did, of like yesterday and help, you know, you've got yesterday ending CD one here and help beginning CD two, and since they're opening help with the James Bond thing, I think that pretty much had to be the, the opener of of the CD. So even though, right. you know, yesterday you would normally put after help if you're going like you know chronologically or you know because it, it was on side two of the help album and came right. out as a single after help in the u.s but um but i think for you know programming if you're looking at it at in terms of separate cds rather than one unified playlist it kind of makes sense to start cd2 with help and maybe end cd1 with yesterday it's a good well, what about track, good starting right track. but as uh, let's take that into a continuous playlist is, is a continuous playlist does that work or it does it does it really matter I don't think it really matters, but if but I don't think if I think if you're going to talk about a continuous playlist, then you have to let me put my um, other versions of Across the Universe. <laughs> see, I see. I don't. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have done that in 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 this context. I wouldn't have done that because yeah. at the time we hadn't heard those. So well, probably the next time these are going to be remastered, they're going to have Giles Martin's new mixes. So. We haven't right. heard those either, right? <laughs> which we have, which, you know, we'll, which we will have to look forward to at some point, probably. Even so. though I haven't listened to these compilations for quite a while, I just remember that they really flowed well. Mm -hmm. yeah, see, that was, that was my question: Did yeah. they did they flow well? And, yeah. and Okay. Okay. Anyway, all right. So that um, I, I mean, I think that I think that says a lot, and I think we've pretty well taken everything that we can take out of the, out of this discussion do, do you is there anything else you guys want to want to talk about uh, as far as these things go not really you think to okay i think we've about reached our time limit i will uh, we'll start with uh, alan tell everybody how they can contact you 
Um, I'm easy to find on Facebook, either under Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Okay. Um, Ken? My email address is everylittlething at att.net, and my website is kenmichaelsradio.com. Just want to mention that uh, within the last couple of weeks since we did our last show, I did an interview with Zach Nilsson. (laughs) <laughs> one of Harry Nilsson's sons. You were expecting Starkey, weren't you? you yeah, the, there was a little bit of the dramatic effect there, Ken. <laughs> like, whoa, really? Okay. But he was a lot of fun. And he talked a lot about his life with his father, and uh, some Beatles stories are in there. And uh, he's got a great speaking voice, too. He should do voice work. Anyway, you can find his interview on interviews page four of my website. It's kind of ironic because I've got Alex Orbison, Roy Orbison's son on there, and then Zach Nilsson, Harry Nilsson's son on there. So um, Here comes the sons. There you go. Um, maybe I'll get all the Nilsson family on that page. Okay. Anyway, and of course, there's always my weekly Beatles trivia where you can win one out of nine prizes every single week just by knowing your Beatles history and, and Beatle music. So... Visit my website at KenMichaelsRadio.com. Okay, and you can get to me. Um, I have my own Facebook page. I have a Beatles News and Information group. And you can get a hold of me at uh, my personal Facebook page, which is uh, I post music and other things. I know people have complained about me posting non-Beatles stuff, but on my personal personal page, I do. And I also have a Beatles news and information group where I post strictly Beatles. And anybody that wants to join is welcome to. We also, as far as the show goes, we have a Things We Said Today Beatles radio show page on Facebook where we post information about the show. Uh, We have a – there's another Things We Said Today show about our broadcasts on fab4radio.com and thanks to Matt at fab4radio.com for broadcasting the show on the weekends uh, as well as running my show as well as running thing. as well as running your show yes that's correct and you can email us with comments criticisms money god knows what god knows what um, at things we said today radio show at gmail.com i think that pretty well kicks it for today guys uh, any any final words i forgot to say one thing go ahead <laughs> this coming saturday which is may the 12th i will be at mesquamica beach in rhode island and joey Moland of bad finger fame will be doing a concert at 8 p.m there as well as phil solemn who's from the band the rembrandts great power pop band and um i might be introducing joey on stage so if you're in the area, please stop by and say hello to me and enjoy that concert this Saturday night. Thank you. Okay. I think that's going to do it, folks. Um, this has been a lot of fun, and we will be back before you know it with another weekly discussion of who knows what about the Beatles. Um, who knows where we'll go. Only we know, and we're not telling right now. <laughs> Anyway, no, we, re- we really don't know. We, <laughs> we, we really don't. In any event, for Alan Cozen and Ken Michaels, this is Steve Marinucci saying thank you for listening to things we said today. Tell your friends about us, and we will see you next time. Mm-hmm.